Okay, so uh, Julie was very comprehensive. Uh, <laughs> so I'm just going to plug in um, into uh, some places where um, maybe try to apply the gender lens uh, to strategies used by some of the different armed groups that we uh, we see on the continent. Um, so gender-based violence um, is a war crime, but you can also see that it has um, some specific motivations, right? It can be used um, to terrorize, it can be used as a revenge mechanism, so one group exacts revenge on another um, through uh, gender-based violence. Um, it can destroy a culture, right? It, it tends to um, really fray the social fabric of a, of a community, so that's one, one way that it's applied um, strategically. And so even, so as Julie said, you know, we see um, rape and other types of gender-based uh, violence happening for, you know, ever since people have been fighting. Um, but a lot of the analysts point to the War of Independence uh, between Bangladesh and Pakistan as um, gender-based violence being used in a, you know, strategic way. Um, not that it hadn't been used before, but when they kind of situate their um, their analysis, so to speak, they look they look at that particular conflict. But we, you know, have seen it um, in Uganda, the Lord's Resistance Army. Uh, Julie talked about uh, going to Gulu, uh, the armed groups in the DRC in the Congo, uh, the Janjaweed in uh, Darfur, Sudan. Um, so really, you know, as it relates to the African continent, we've seen gender-based violence used in this uh, very strategic uh, way. I want to talk a, a little bit about Boko Haram. We've kind of talked about it a lot this morning. Um, but Boko Haram is also quite unique in this, in this way uh, and how they, in the last several years, have kind of honed in on um, using women both as uh, as perpetrators and as, as victims in this strategic way. So this is kind of applying the gender lens in how, um, how to think about a conflict um, sort of taking, taking place and you know, why that would be um, important. Um, a lot of extremists, well, a lot of, not just extremists, but a lot of armed groups have used women or deployed women really um, for shock value right? Um, also because uh, women can evade uh, being searched in a similar way. They're seen as less threatening um, and uh, in more conservative societies. Well, not just more conservative, but in many communities, um, gender-based violence can really kind of tear up a community. Um, and so it's an effective way to um, diminish, um, diminish uh, resistance. Uh, Boko Haram really started developing a kind of gendered approach in about 2012. So there are a lot of analysts that looked at what the organization was doing and saw that um, they began to specifically target women for abduction. Uh, Boko Haram uh, was doing this uh, as revenge or as um, kind of um, lowering uh, morale. Uh, they began using uh, female suicide bombers in 2014. And when um, compared to other groups, uh, Boko Haram has used um, female suicide bombers as a, at a higher rate than uh, many others. Uh, one um, analysis that I read compared Boko Haram to the Tamil Tigers in Sri Lanka, which have, you know, we're also um, quite a, a vicious group. Between June 14, between June 2014, when Boko Haram started using female suicide bombers, and January 2016, uh, Boko Haram used women more than 90 times. In a 10-year span, uh, the Tamil Tigers deployed women 46 times, um, and that Boko Haram really kind of stands out in that way. So, you know, what is this kind of strategic advantage that Boko Haram is seeing in, in 
um, uh, using women. One, it reinforces their arguments that they, you know, they try to C contrast themselves, uh, you know, against other Salafist movements, saying that we are, you know, the truer um, uh, differentiating itself. Um, they also use women to kind of show how vicious they are, um, sort of increasing their effectiveness, if you will, as a, a terrorist um, organization. Uh, they've also promised, you know, women to, you know, as wives. Uh, maybe to other to men that might not have the social capital uh, to marry, and if that's an important part of um, being a man or you know asserting yourself, uh, then you know that becomes um, important. It's also a way to dis when they target Christian women. It's also a way to disempower sort of Christian men, saying you are unable to um, you know protect um, the more vulnerable members of your society. So so. Uh, in, increasingly, Boko Haram has, has used women as part of its strategy in, in propagating uh, war. So that's, you know, one way to, to sort of look at conflict through this, this gender uh, lens. Um, Julie talked about how it can appeal to um, different masculine uh, roles and duties. Another group that has done this uh, not by targeting women, but by the messaging that they uh, send to, to men is Al Shabaab um, in in Somalia. Uh, so if you look at sort of the clan system in Somalia, which is associated with uh, becoming a respected elder, with employment and marriage and children, in the context of Somalia as it is today, that's very difficult uh, to attain. But Al Shabaab has provided that opportunity to a lot of um, a lot of men. So it's now a recruiting tool, but through a gendered lens. Um, there's a study done by Anneli Bota. Uh, she's at, with uh, the Institute for Security Studies in Pretoria, and she's done a couple of studies that looks at why um, Al Shabaab was appealing. What did they? What was their recruitment strategy? And well, one of the things that she finds that I think was interesting was that economic grievances were the most common reason given by these former members as, you know, wanting to join um, Al Shabaab. A purely sort of religious affinity, sort of, you know, you know, we are joining Al Shabaab because we believe what that believe what they're saying on a religious basis uh, was 15 percent, and. Uh, you know, so clearly some other, that's not the main reason why people are um, joining Al-Shabaab. Almost all, about 99%, uh, saw Al-Shabaab as being feared uh, and respected. They felt that being armed brought them respect. That was 98%. And only 17% uh, saw Al-Shabaab as a solution to Somalia's problems. So there are some deeper issues of identity and belonging that are pushing um, uh, these young men uh, to join Al Shabaab. So, when if you're looking at it from um, a much broader lens, then that uh, brings out different narratives uh, to the uh, the conflict. Another another way to uh, think about how gender affects insecurity is to look at humanitarian workers and. Um, men and women dif uh, experience different levels of insecurity in their uh, um, course of their jobs, their humanitarian workers. <coughs> there, are not, there are not many studies that look at this, although you can come up with um, anecdotal evidence. But there is, there is one, actually, that I, that I found. Uh, the one, one thing to note is that men and women are equally likely to be killed in the course of um, being a humanitarian worker, but they suffer different levels, different types of insecurity. Uh, women are more likely to be victims of crime or, or to be threatened, um, and they're mo more likely to be attacked by either criminals or civilians, but men are more likely to be attacked by non-armed, by, by non-state actors. Some of that might be due to where men and women uh, work, whether they choose to be there or are posted 
uh, different, different places, women experience more insecurity in urban areas, whereas men are in more rural areas. So that gives you some clue as to why they experience different types of um, insecurity. But it also um, you know, sort of helps to focus on the, the types of protection that need to be afforded to men and women uh, because they um, have different security uh, concerns. I want to turn a little bit to, uh, Julie started to talk about inclusive security as a mechanism for durable peace. And, you know, she talked about bringing the different pieces of the, of the puzzles together. And if you apply a gender lens to peace building, what it does, it, it also brings forth different narratives. People experience different, uh, you know, ex experience a different, um, have different experiences during conflict. Um, we've seen that women can be victims as well as perpetrators, you know, through the um, uh, Boko Haram example. Uh, but we actually are now um, look, we now have the ability to look at large scale quantitative data that looks at what happens when you broaden the number of, um, of stakeholders. So uh, before I talk about that, um, just to go back to the UN Security Council resolution, um, at the time that it was signed in 2000, only 11% of all peace agreements addressed issues that were, that related to uh, women specifically. Um, now, about two thirds of all peace agreements do this. So on the one hand, we've seen a lot of, of uh, improvement in terms of um, peace agreements addressing issues that you might say relate uh, to women's experience in war. But we still don't see women as part of the peacemaking process. Uh, signatories, they are only 4%. Uh, as chief mediators, about 2%. Witnesses to agreements, uh, three percent. Negotiators, nine percent. So this is so in the process of negotiating peace, women are still very much um, on the margins. Why might this be um, the case? Uh, some point to reluctance. Uh, Julie mentioned uh, when she was, uh, uh, was it Turkey. Mm -hmm. it, uh, and, you know, just the um, emphasis on focusing on those with guns. And that's important. You know, you want to stop the fighting. But that's not the only narrative in uh, the conflict. Uh, what comes after that? And that's where others that might not have been part of armed groups um, have different things to add. If they've been left behind, they might have... Um, questions about reintegration or living with their um, neighbors, um, dealing with child soldiers that might not make it into the negotiating process, but are important in sustaining durable peace. And in fact, there's uh, work that um, speaks to this. Um, there's one study that looked at 40 different peace processes between 1990 and 2013, and it shows that uh, when you broaden the number of stakeholders, peace is actually much more uh, durable. It also shows that the peace process moves faster when you broaden the number of stakeholders. In, um, in West Africa, Liberia had about 16 different peace agreements. And I often, you know, when I read this, I often uh, say to myself, you know, would Liberia have needed 16 different peace agreements if they had a much broader set of stakeholders at the table? Um, you, you know, peace tends to, uh, peace processes or peace agreements tend to break down about 50% of the time within the course of five years. Uh, if you had a more complete process, would you have much, uh, you know, more durable peace? But now we do have evidence that if, if the time is taken, to broaden uh, the set of stakeholders, your chances of peace breaking down and it actually being more durable is much, uh, is much higher. 
But it's not just enough to have women at the table, right? They have to be involved in a much more meaningful way. Uh, so how do you train women to be good neg negotiators, um, setting the agenda, all the things that make mediation successful? And there are a number of organizations um, that do that. Um, there's NDI, there's inclusive security here in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, but, but it's important to make sure that the women are involved in meaningful ways. Uh, if they didn't carry arms, can, can women be put in, um, included in the post-conflict uh, or peace-building portion of the, of the process? So the bottom line, I'll conclude here, is that a post-conflict phase that includes uh, women, and just if you think of women as just broadening the, the set of stakeholders, are a lot more durable and move a lot faster than if you have more exclusive um, processes. Thank you.